What's happening, Jakarta? You guys doing all right? It's good to have you here today. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Um, like Pastor Ron said, my name is Tim Gillespie, and I'm the lead pastor at Crosswalk Church in Redlands. Um, and I have the opportunity and the incredible blessing to um, be the teaching pastor for our growing network of churches here in, um, here in the world, in the global world. One, one of the campuses that he didn't mention was our Melbourne campus in Australia that is currently growing and they're doing work about to launch a weekly worship service. They've been meeting together for a couple of years at this point. But I just want to thank you for having us here. And I'd love to start off with the opportunity just to pray with you if we can. So let's bow our heads. Lord of grace, um, it's amazing to be able to say good morning, Jakarta. Lord, we're a long way from home, but we're very close to the homes of each person here. And so, Lord, I want to thank you for giving us a message that is global, that is a message of love, a message of care. Lord, it's a message that Jesus gave us while he was here and a message that continues on into eternity. So it is my prayer today that as we open up your word, we get an opportunity to spend a little time with you, to vision about what the church can be, and to grow in love towards you and towards one another if you, as you have asked us to. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. So about nine years ago, I was working in healthcare. Um, I was working in the Department of Community Health Development. So I was working with churches, getting them interested in um, what, getting them interested in what a healthy expression of being human is, right? So I was working with Loma Linda University, <clears throat> the health system, and I would go to churches and I would tell them about things that we know about health and, and well-being and those sorts of things. And these churches from all different denominations started to get really interested in what we could do together with the healthcare system and what we could do. And it was great. And I was blessed to be working in that space. And um, I got this opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, to work with some um, innovative consultants, some consultants on innovation. And um, it was funny because they were consulting on innovation in healthcare. And I had been a pastor for 20 years, and now I'm working in healthcare. And so they would teach us about innovation for healthcare. And the whole time I was thinking about church. And so I'd sit with these really, if you want to know the truth, very expensive consultants, $25,000 a day. The church, churches would never pay for this. <clears throat> and I'd listen to what they'd say, and I would go home at night, and I would rework what they had told me about innovation and how it would work in church. And God had this calling on my heart. I had not been a lead pastor at that point. I was, um, I was thinking that I was kind of done with pastoral ministry now as moving into healthcare. And then I got this call one day from our conference, our Seventh-day Adventist conference, the Southeastern California Conference. And our president said, hey, would you like to be the pastor of Crosswalk Church? And I knew Crosswalk Church because I had been there and a good friend of mine had planted that church back in 2003. But I also knew, this is about 2014, I also knew that in 2010, the, the founding pastor left that church and there was about six, 700 people worshiping. And now in 2014, there was about 85 people worshiping. The church was falling apart. So when she called me up and said, would you like to, number one, make less money? Number two, work at a church that is failing. And number three, change the trajectory of your life back to ministry. I thought, no, that's a bad idea. For the first time in our adult lives, my wife and I got to choose where we went to church. We got to choose if we went to church. There were days we didn't go to church. We just stayed home. I had never had that as a pastor, you know, because pastors have to show up to church every week, all the time. And so I went to my wife. I said, listen, this church has asked me to be a pastor. And she said, no, that's dumb. I said, oh, thank you for your support. Um, and I said, I don't know. I feel like maybe, maybe I should. And she said, no, that's not God. Because sometimes our wives know. She said, that can't be God. I said, I don't know. I feel like maybe it is God. And so, so I called up the conference president and I said, Do they, does the church want to talk to me? And, you know, like interview me. And she said, I don't think so. 
They just want you to come and pastor. So we prayed about it and we thought about it. We prayed about it. And ultimately we ended up saying yes. So I get to the church and we hold a board meeting like you do at church. And the first thing, the first agenda item on the board meeting was, should we shut down Crosswalk? That's the first agenda on the board meeting. I just got there. Like Monday, Tuesday was the board meeting. The first thing they want to say is, should we shut this down? I thought, no, I just took this job. Please don't shut it down. But they said, listen, we have no money. We, we can maybe keep the doors open for two, three more months, maybe. Nobody comes to church anymore. Um, maybe we should just shut it down. Well, I argued against that. And I said, listen, maybe we should trust that God is going to bring exactly the right people at exactly the right time to build his kingdom. Because I believe that Crosswalk has a role to play in the expanding the kingdom of God. And they said, well, okay, I guess we'll keep it open. Not a great way to start ministry at a church, by the way. So, so uh, we started to change some things. And many of us have been to very traditional churches. Crosswalk was never a traditional church. It was always a church that had contemporary worship. It was always a church that, um, in fact, it was the first church in Adventism to live stream its services back in 2001. I mean, it was a long time ago. Well, you remember when you had to dial in? I don't know, did you do that here? Of course you did. You guys probably always had like very better internet than we did. But um, so, so it's always been kind of an innovative church. But I started to, I started to, have the opportunity to put together some of the things that I had learned with these innovation consultants on how to change culture and how to, how to move towards excellence and then how to do something different that hadn't been done in church before. The good news is this church had really good DNA because the thing that they said right at the very beginning is that we're a church that is learning to love well. That was their mission statement, learning to love well. And so I knew that these were a group of people that cared but I also knew that there were other people that needed what this church had to offer. The very first statement of Crosswalk Church in all of our Crosswalk churches, the very first statement, we call them in statements, is that Crosswalk will be a community of belonging. And that means that when someone walks in the door, they belong. We don't even know who they are, but they're family. As soon as they walk in the door, they might not even be Avenist, but they belong to our community. They may not even be Christians, but we want them there worshiping with us and learning about who Jesus is. We wanted to be the place that had the most love so people would bring their friends and their family and their coworkers so those people could experience the love that they were experiencing. And we know that that love comes from somewhere. That love comes from the way that Jesus has loved us. And so we just started to change things. We started to get different lights because the lights they had were old and falling apart. And one actually fell off the roof one time, which is a bad idea. We started to upgrade our sound system a little bit. More than anything, we started to talk about what church could be if we weren't stuck in tradition, if we weren't stuck in the way that we think church has to be, but we had the opportunity to build a church that was relevant to us that, that felt like what we felt, that sounded like the music that we listened to all week, but even better because it was pointed towards Jesus. What would it look like to walk into a church with a group of people who wanted you there? Not just wanted you there, but were excited to see you. What if we were a church that didn't have its own kind of Christian Seventh-day Adventist language, but it had a language that was accessible to everyone? And I'll tell you what we started to see is we started to see people actually respond. People come, people who hadn't been in church in 30 years. I'll never forget, there was this old gentleman. He was probably in his 70s, which doesn't feel as old as it used to for me, just so you know. 70 sounds pretty good to me now. But he would sit in the back and he was there for a few weeks. I had known him. I had seen him somewhere before, but I wasn't sure. So one day after church, I went up to him and I said, hey, I think I know you. And he said, yes, I was your electrician three jobs ago, right? When I was working at an academy somewhere. He said, yeah, I was the electrician there. And he said, I I just want you to know I like what you're doing. I said, oh, that's great. And he said, no, I need you to know I haven't been at church in 30 years. 
He said, in fact, the last time I was at church, I was the head deacon of this other church. And they treated me so poorly that I walked out of that church and I haven't been to church in 30 years. And my daughter said, dad, you should try out this church. Now she said that to me over the last 30 years and I never was interested. But for some reason, this time it made sense. And so I've come, this is my third week. I think this may be my home. And he said, but I wanna know something. You say that you're learning to love well. Is that real? Is that true? Or am I gonna come here in a few weeks and nobody's gonna care that I'm showing up anymore? Am I gonna come here and just be another person in a church that's growing? And I said, well, test us on it. See if we don't love you well every single time you come. But you gotta make a promise to us that when you show up, you're gonna love well as well. You're gonna love well too, so that love is gonna be all around. And he said, well, I've been, you know, I used to come to church a long time ago and we talk about love, but do we actually love? That was, that was a challenge. Because when you say that you're gonna love well, people are gonna hold you to it. That is a contract you are making with everyone who walks in the door that they will be loved the way that Jesus has loved you. And you're gonna love them from the overflow of your heart because Jesus has loved you so well. So I can tell you lots of stories like that, but the next few years were an incredible moment of growth. We grew from about 85 people to close to 1,000 people. And that was just incredible. We got to three services, and then we did what every church does that grows. Well, what's next? Our building doesn't hold many more people. What should we do? Most churches, they make the decision to find a bigger building, spend more, and continue to grow right there. But we didn't feel like that's what we were called to. We actually felt like maybe there was a different calling because we took seriously what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Go into all the world, preaching, teaching, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. Like We believed in growing the kingdom of God. And we weren't sure if just getting a bigger building was the way to do that. And I had three friends show up one day, friends who lived together but didn't know they were gonna be, they lived in Tennessee, didn't know they were gonna be in California on the same day, ended up sitting together. And I was talking to them after church and they said, man, we really wish we had a church like Crosswalk where we live. There's just, it just doesn't feel right, the churches that we go to. They talk a lot about love, but they don't actually love. Now I'm not slamming any other church, you know, churches are different things in you know, different seasons. But they said, could we, could we start a crosswalk church in Tennessee? And I'm really dumb. Like, I'm not the smartest person. And so I thought, yeah, why not? A local church can plant a church somewhere else. That's fine. <laughs> right? So I said, yeah, we'll figure it out. So they left. We started talking to people. And we learned that this had never happened in the Seventh-day Adventist church before. Because the Seventh-day Adventist church plants churches not local churches. We have a tendency to split churches when we don't get along, right? And we call that growth. I'm not sure. It's weird that we divide and that's multiplying. That's not quite exactly how it works, but okay. So, so we started working with this group in Tennessee and everybody was kind of waiting to see what would happen. I'll tell you more about that story later. Over the years, things, got, things changed a little bit. One, we went from learning to love well as our mission statement to simply love well. It's easier to remember. You can put it on a t-shirt a little better. But it's also a statement. When you come into one of our facilities, when you come into one of our churches, you will be loved well. That is our promise and our commitment to you. And God continued to grow the church. We went to LA and started to plant a church just 45 minutes away from us. We got a call from a group of people up in Portland, Oregon, which is a state away, about 14 hours driving. And they said, we'd like to start one. Do you think we can? We tried it and we started. We started it the day the pandemic started. That was a bad time to plant a church. But 250 people worshiping there every day, every week now. And then in New England, 
And I was realizing when you were telling us about the different places, we are all across the United States, all four corners, not close to each other. But this is how God moves because God says, go into all the world, whether it's next door, whether it's a few states over, or whether it's all the way across the world, preaching, teaching, baptizing them in my name. We call this the Great Commission. That's the words that we use for this particular text, the Great Commission. But I don't think it's just the Great Commission, in other words, God telling us to go. I think it is the Great Co-Mission. God says, you don't have to go by yourself. I'm going to go with you. And when God is involved in something, it has a way of working out. Here's the thing. We look at Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and, and those texts that I just quoted a bunch of times, but we don't look at the texts that come a little bit before it. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to Matthew 28, verse 16, because that's where we're going to start today. Matthew 28, verse 16. It says this, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now, this is after Jesus had shown up to Mary and the women at the tomb and so this bit of the story begins with the 11 disciples who went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. The very first thing that you have to do if you're going to expand the kingdom of God is you have to obey God, right? They went to the mountain where he told them to go. And I know this seems really obvious, but if you're going to follow God, you've got to go where he tells you. And you never know where that's going to be. When God is calling us to move into something new, when God begins to trust us with a big plan, a big project, or a big opportunity, he asks us to do something small first. And he says to his disciples, hey, can you just show up at that mountain where I told you to show up? That's not much. God is testing our obedience. And in this story, it was that the disciples go to a mountain. But here's the question I have for you today. What mountain is God calling you to go to? Where in your life are you supposed to be obedient to what God is calling you to? It may not be a big thing. In fact, it probably isn't because big things only happen after small things have been taken care of. So where is it that God is calling you in your life today to go, to receive your instructions about what the next steps in your life are going to be and what the next steps in your ministry are going to be? Because God has given every single one of you a ministry that is particular to you and uniquely yours. I know when we talk about ministry, we think about the church and we think about pastors and we think about sometimes leaders or department heads or however you wanna organize it. But even if you're somebody who's just come to church and never served, God has something very particular for you to do in this world that will expand the kingdom of God. Because there's somebody that you can speak to somebody that you can talk to, somebody that you can have coffee or tea with that no one else can, that can speak Jesus into their lives. So every single one of us has a ministry. Where does God call you to go in Jakarta to hear his voice and receive your calling? Do you know that Jakarta, well, you know this. I don't, I should, I'm gonna tell you about Jakarta now. That's really rude, I'm sorry. There's like 33 million people in this city. By the way, always on the road at the same time? It's amazing. So how can any of us make an impact for the kingdom of God in a city like this? How do you take that many people and make an impact? Well, this is what we like to say at Crosswalk. Ministry happens in the millimeters, not in the kilometers. Ministry happens a little bit at a time. Ministry happens when you invite a friend to lunch and tell them why you go to church each week. Not even ask them. Just let them know that this is something that's important to you. Because it's important for us to know this. God does big things in little ways. God does big, huge projects and expands the universe, but he does it in little, tiny ways. I call this the power of accretion. It's a particular word, right? It's the slow buildup over time. My water heater started leaking last week. I don't know if you've ever had that happen in your house when your water heater starts to leak. And if you don't catch it, it'll just leak through your whole house because there's a whole bunch of water in there. Luckily, I caught it. I noticed that there was a few drips happening. And so I looked at the faucet and the faucet was dripping. There's no reason that the, I never touched that faucet. There's no reason that it should be dripping. So I got on YouTube like you do and you figure out how to fix it before you call the plumber. 
which most of the time I end up just, I should probably just call the plumber, but this one I thought I could fix. So I watched all the YouTube things, waited till the next day, we had a bucket there. And the next day I told my wife, I'm gonna fix this. And my wife knows me and doesn't trust that I can fix this thing. And I said, no, honey, I can do this. And she said, okay. And then she stood there the whole time, making sure I could do it. And it was good because there were times I really needed her. But when I got the faucet off and put the new one on, I took a look at the faucet and realized it's not that anything had failed. It's that slowly over time, there had been buildup, there had been an accretion of detritus, of stuff, and it finally just opened the valve a little bit. This is how God works in the world. It's not by all of a sudden doing an amazing revival where thousands or millions of people are changed. Sometimes God works like that. And when he does, it's incredible. But you know how God mostly works? God mostly works through you and through an invitation. And it's not even a big invitation. It's, hey, I'm going to grab lunch. Do you want to come? And getting to know somebody a little better. It's, it's the accretion of a relationship over years of time where they find that you're trustworthy and the God that you serve has made you into a different kind of person. And eventually when they decide that they want what you have in your life, because what you have is so overwhelmingly filled with love, that's a big thing that God does through you. The kingdom of heaven grows one person at a time, not just through the conversion of crowds, but through conversation. This is the way the kingdom of God expands. And this is the way 250 people make an impact on 33 million. We tell this to every single one of our churches. Every year, once a year, bring one person. That's all you have to do. Bring one person to church one time in 52 weeks. And when they do that, and we've made good on our promise to be a community of belonging, we see the kingdom of God expand. So that was just the first. There's an obedience section, and then God works through that accretion. Number, verse 17, back to the verse. When they saw him, they worshiped him, and some doubted. So now they're on the mountain and they're, they're, they see Jesus and they begin to worship them and some doubt. Now that's interesting. People were worshiping and doubting at the same time. I don't know about you, but I'm a human being. I probably don't have to tell you that. Right? I'm a human being. Some days I believe a lot. Some days I have questions. This is what's interesting about worship. And every one of our churches worships like this. And you guys worship so well. The band was amazing. The singers were amazing. And you all were amazing. Because this is what we believe about worshiping God. Sometimes you worship God in the doubt because it becomes a shield against that doubt. Sometimes you worship God through the doubt. Sometimes you worship God because of the doubt and you need to believe in God a little more. And so you worship because worship becomes a weapon against evil in this world. Sometimes when we're not sure what we think about anything, we go and we worship and we let those worship songs do our believing for us just for a little while to bridge the gap until we can really lean into our faith again. This is why we worship in every single one of our churches. And this is why we try and worship with reckless abandon. I love it when someone comes to one of our churches and says, hmm, this doesn't feel very Adventist. Because we're a pretty, I want to think of a good word. We're pretty rigid people. Is that a word? Sometimes we don't like to have too much fun or we don't look like we want to have too much fun. We're very serious about church, right? We come to church and we're gonna love God hard. Well, listen, we worship God because we understand that sometimes there's doubt. You know the story found in Mark 9? about this dad who comes to Jesus and he says, listen, I need you to heal my boy, right? Because there's an evil spirit in him. Mark 9 verse 20 says this, so they brought the boy, but when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. Mouth, this is bad. Jesus says, hey, how long has this been happening? He asked the boy's father. The boy's father replied, since he was a boy, a little boy, the spirit often throws him to the fire or into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus goes, if I can? Are you kidding? Of 
Of course I can. What do you mean if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. And this man said, I think one of the most brilliant things in scripture. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. I believe in what you're saying, but I still struggle to understand it. You're the God of the universe and I want to believe in everything that you say you are, but I live in this world, in this place, and it's hard sometimes. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this boy unable to hear and speak, he said, I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. See, this man believed, but he struggled with unbelief and Jesus got him to where he needed to go. These things both exist in us simultaneously, but that doesn't mean that doubt wins. Acknowledging doubt, praying through doubt, worshiping past doubt, and trusting in God moves us forward. And the second part is about worship. We worship God in order to grow through past and beyond doubt. We use worship as a weapon against Satan and to remember what God has called us to. In ancient times, they used to build these these altars, they called them. When something big would happen, they would say, listen, put a bunch of rocks together so every time you walk by this place, you'll be able to see what God has done. And so the ancient Israelites thought about moving towards the future by looking at the past. So they walked backwards into the future into what God was calling them to, always knowing that God is faithful. After nine years of being at Crosswalk and seeing amazing miracles happen, there's some, there's some big altars that I get to look back to and say, listen, I know God's been faithful. I know God will be faithful now. Again, let me tell you one story. Back to Chattanooga. Chattanooga had just moved into a new building after the pandemic. They were renting from a church that met on Sunday. And this church was having some issues. Their pastor had a moral failure. He had an affair. And it was this really big, massive church. And it had kind of imploded when he did this. And it was, it was falling apart. Our first weekend there, we're getting ready on Friday night for our service on Saturday. And uh, they didn't have any trash bins out in the back. And I said to them, that's strange. Why do they not? And they said, oh, well, it's been repossessed. I guess this church is not paying their bills. And I said, you guys need to be ready because there's going to be an opportunity to buy this building. It's a massive building. I said, there's going to be an opportunity to buy this building. Just get prepared. My bet is in the next year, we're going to have an opportunity to buy this building. It was two weeks later that they declared bankruptcy. Two weeks later that that building went up for auction. And because we were leasing there, we had the right of first refusal. This church goes to the conference and asks, hey, can we borrow the money? They don't have that much money now. There's about 600, 800 people worshiping. They said, we don't have this much money right now. We haven't raised it. Can we borrow the money? And the conference said, no, that's too much. And then as they were leaving the office, the conference president said, well, I guess if you could raise, I don't know, $2 million, we'll come up with another million and a half so you can purchase this building. Um, but how long do you have to do it? And they, our church said, well, they've only given us two weeks and then it's going to go up on the auction block and somebody else is going to buy it. And so our team left the president's office, prayed, Lord, we want to do big things. Help us raise $2 million. So in two weeks, lay people, no pastor, raised $2.4 million to buy the building. In two weeks, I've never seen that happen before. And by the way, 200, 226 individual gifts, no gifts over $100,000 until the very last hour. So it wasn't that someone with a lot of money came and just dumped the money in. It was so many people from across our network believing that God was gonna do something good and was gonna do something good through them. And so that's an altar that I look back to say, hey, something big is happening. And God has been good. So what's the next big thing God is going to do? Plant a church in Melbourne, Australia? Okay, let's see if we can do that. Come to Jakarta and start having conversations about what God is doing through this movement here. Let's do it. So moving on in the text, Matthew 28, 16, 17, now we're in 18. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. You know, we have a tendency to quote verses 19 and 20, but forget about verse 18. It means this. It means that everything on heaven and earth is under the rule of Jesus. And that means we are under the rule of Jesus. And that means the 33 million people in Jakarta are under the rule of Jesus as well. 
It means that Jesus has a plan for every single one of those people to come in contact with a love that they've never experienced before. And chances are they're gonna come in contact with a love that they've never experienced before, not miraculously, but through you. Through the way that you live your life and the way that other people experience love through you. By the way that you love well. And I know, listen, trust me, it's easy to say, you know, this, this country is not Christian. People aren't interested. But there's a book I would suggest everybody read. It's by a guy named Carl Sedaris. He was a missionary to Lebanon, which is a Muslim country. And he worked there for seven years. Do you know how many people he baptized? Not a one. And in fact, they put this in this building. They had this center of influence, they called it. And, and they were there to just influence the Muslim population. Fascinating. And he said nobody ever came by the building. So they were influencing no one. And so he had to think about what evangelism was and what it means to tell people about Jesus and how it works in a context that's very difficult. And you know what he came up with? I think it's brilliant. So stay with me here. He said he realized at some point that Jesus was the center of the universe and we're all in orbit around Jesus. And our job as Christians and a Seventh-day Adventist is that when our orbit comes in contact with somebody else's orbit, all we have the opportunity to do is move their orbit a little bit closer to Jesus. And you may be in contact with somebody for five minutes, for five years, or for 50 years, but your job with them, if they don't know Jesus, is just to move their orbit a little bit closer to Jesus. This is how it worked in my life. I was teaching at a Christian university, Azusa Pacific University. And I was teaching in the nursing program, talking about faith and health. And um, I had this woman who was Muslim and she came up to me at the end of class and she said, I just, I so appreciated this class. I want you to know that, um, that I'm a Muslim. And I was like, it's pretty clear. And, and she said, but I also want you to know I love Jesus. What do I do? And I know in my head, the first thing I thought is being a Christian. Well, you got to drop everything and you got to be a Christian and that's it. And she said, you know, my husband's from Iran and we have seven children. How do I love Jesus and be a Muslim? And I thought, how, how do you do that? It's one of those moments in ministry where God says, don't talk yet. And so rather than just saying what was my first move, I prayed and I prayed and I just opened up and I feel like the Holy Spirit worked. And, and I said, the Holy Spirit said, I believe. Just love Jesus in the context that you're in. You don't have to go to a Christian church. Just continue to follow Jesus in the way that makes sense to you and your family. I saw her about three years later. I just happened to see her in a grocery store. And she came up and she said, oh, Pastor Tim, I want you to know over three years, I've fallen in love with Jesus even more. And my family all has fallen in love with Jesus. We love Jesus. We're Muslim. I was like, that's great. I'm never going to baptize her. But she knows who Jesus is. And we'll let Jesus and the Holy Spirit work on her heart. That's all we have to do. See, because all authority has been given to Jesus, that the work we do in Jesus' name has the authority of the whole universe. And so we don't go and yell at people that they should believe like us. What we do is we love people and they want to be part of what we're doing. Verse 19, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know what I love about that verse? It mentions all three parts of the Trinity. And you know what's so great about the Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a model for community. It means that God has always been in community with himself. It means that relationships matter. And it means that as you get to know people, you get to even be more and more alike. Have you seen people who've been married for like 70 years? They look the same. Have you seen people who have animals, who have pets, that they love so much they kind of look like their pets? That's kind of what we're talking about. There's this word, it's a Greek word, it's, a, it's, it's, it's perichoresis or perichoresis, which means mutual indwelling. The Trinity is so close to be as one. That's the model for community. 
all of us realizing what the church can be and moving in that direction, inviting people along as they will, just so that they can be loved better. And so it says, therefore, go and make disciples, people who learn, people who are open, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now, this is where the church gets a little weird sometimes. Because sometimes the church wants us, or we feel like we have to teach everybody every single thing that's in Scripture before they can become a part of us. But you know what Jesus commands us to do? When he is asked, what are the most important things? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's all. So when we teach people what Jesus commanded us, we teach people to love. And you know how we teach people to love? By loving them. Could it really be this easy? I get asked a lot. Could it really be that we just have to love people and they'll come to our communities and they'll become our friends and they'll grow in grace and love and understand who Jesus is? Can it really be that easy? Because we've made it difficult. We've given people long lists of things they have to learn before they get to be a part of what we're doing. But I can tell you after nine years of making sure that I preach the love of Jesus in season and out of season, and every time I talk about a doctrine, I talk about a doctrine in Jesus so that they can understand why it's important. I've seen our churches, I've seen Redlands grow and then I've seen the overflow of that love move to Chattanooga and to New England and to Portland and to Los Angeles and to Houston and so many other conversations that we're having with other people who just want to continue to grow church in a way that is simple, that expresses the love of God. We make life way too difficult. If you're not sure what to do, love. If you're not sure what to say, be gracious and love. If you're not sure how to get someone to the next step, just love them and let the Holy Spirit work on their heart. So I guess I've got a, a few questions for you today. Number one, how are you called to go where God wants you to go? What is that little thing that God is asking you to obey him in so that he can move you towards the bigger things that he's going to do through you? In fact, how is God doing big things already in little ways in your life? I also want you to ask yourselves how you're using worship as a weapon against the evil in this world and how you're using worship to fill in the gaps of the doubt that you have in your life so that we can worship with reckless abandon knowing how good God is. How are you moving the orbits of those around you towards Jesus, who is the center and circumference of our faith. And maybe the biggest question that I have for you today is simply this. How are you loving well? Church is not hard. And love is not complicated. We commit to making sure that the people who are next to us, that the people who come into our influence, that the people who come into our orbit know Jesus a little more because of the way that we love them. It's not always a theological conversation. Sometimes it's just letting them in line ahead of you because they're in a rush and they need to get done what they need to get done in life. Sometimes it's a gracious smile when someone seems upset. And sometimes it's being willing to stay while they talk about what's going on in their lives so you can show them that God cares about them by your presence and your attention. Listen, I'm excited. I'm excited for what God has been doing as we look at the altars he's laid in our path. And I'm excited about what God is going to do, whether it's here in Jakarta or any of the other places that we're talking to. And just be clear, Crosswalk is not the only church God is working in right now. God is, it has authority of all of heaven and all earth. God is working everywhere, but we get this little moment and this little opportunity to lean in specifically to what God is doing. And I'm so excited about the way God is going to move as we talk about working together, 
as we find opportunities to share, and as we grow the kingdom of God and expand what God is doing in the world. Because I don't know about you, but this week, it's been a tough week. I grew up in Israel. Every summer, I go for three or four months. My dad did archaeology there. So those places that I'm seeing, those are places I've been to and I have friends at, both on the Israeli and the Palestinian side. We're in a complicated time in Earth's history. So you know what the world needs now more than anything else? It needs the love that you have to bring to it. Because no one's going to say they have too much love in their lives. It's like if someone's giving you a diamond, you're probably not going to say, you know what, that's just too big. Right? I, I don't need that much. That's the way it is with love too. The more you offer, the more is taken, and the more you have. So today, I just want to admonish you to love and love well. Let's bow our heads together. God of the universe, you are overwhelming. You are so good and you are so powerful. Lord, I don't ever want to stop the work that you're doing because I'm not willing to love, because I'm not willing to take a chance or willing to take a risk. Lord, I have seen you. I've seen you do miracles. I've seen you change people's lives. I've seen you make people interested in faith when they were never interested in faith before. So Lord, I got to believe that you're still going to do that. And you're not going to do that just in Redlands, California or other places that we've talked about. You're going to do it wherever you are and you are everywhere. So Lord, just open our eyes to where you're already working so we can lean in and see the miracle of people coming to you through the love that we show them. Lord, I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for this place and these people and their willingness to engage a conversation about what it means to love well. Lord, thank you. And in your name I pray, amen. Stand and worship with us one more time.